All right, um, I'm gonna get started. Uh, this is, um, since we are in the lunch hour during the week, uh, I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna be a little more prompt than I am on the weekends, uh, just to make sure we stay on time, because I know people may have uh, obligations afterwards, depending on what time zone they're in. Um, my name is Jason Petticone. I'm the president and co-founder of the Pi Day Institute. And uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this most recent installment of our free online lecture series. Um, it's a great honor and really a thrill to welcome uh, Professor Malambo, who is uh, in Zimbabwe, um, where he is Associate Professor of Classical Studies and History at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, his research interests cover um, broad and multidisciplinary perspectives on um, understanding the relationship of the Greek and Roman classics and Africa, um, and also understanding the concept of classics more broadly. Uh, as we were chatting before the participants came in, Professor Mlambo was telling me about some really fascinating new modules that are being rolled out in Southern Africa um, to start teaching classics at the universities, which is very exciting. Um, and I think uh, we all in uh, the uh, in, in the US and, and other contexts that we're coming at from classics, uh, will probably have a lot to learn from the work they do there. So uh, very exciting to see that growth and um, very excited to hear today uh, a bit about uh, Professor Mlambo's work in his talk on land expropriation in ancient Rome and contemporary Zimbabwe. So with that, uh, Professor, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, colleagues. Greetings from Zimbabwe. Um, the introductions are in order. So I straight away uh, begin my, my, my talk. So the title of my presentation, Land Expropriation in Ancient Rome and Contemporary Zimbabwe, Veterans must claim it and war. When one um, looks at such a title, which tries to bring together very disparate um, societies that are not connected uh, geographically, that are not connected temporarily, that are not connected sociologically, um, it sounds rather counterintuitive. Um, to anyone who may want to try and figure out the logic of such a comparison. Um, but as you see, it is really not um, as it seems because there is a connection which I have managed to, to make uh, without necessarily forcing the, the comparison, uh, but it comes out um, you know, naturally as I was exploring the themes of comparison in this study. Uh, it is perhaps imperative for me to begin by unpacking or giving some background to Zimbabwe, which might not be a familiar uh, territory to uh, some people in the West, I have heard people thinking that Africa is a country. So small, when you talk of a small country like Zimbabwe, they may really get lost to you know, figure out what one would be talking about. So Zimbabwe is indeed a country and Africa is not a country, Africa is a continent. Zimbabwe is a country, the, as you can see on the map uh, in red color, that teapot shaped um, you know, country in, in the southern uh, end of uh, the map of Africa. That is where Zimbabwe is located. Um, in Southern Africa, of course, between Zambia um, to the north and South Africa to the south. This country used to be colonized by the British under the names of Southern Rhodesia and Rhodesia and it became independent in 1980 under Prime Minister Robert Mugabe the Let. We eventually became president of the country. And in the year 2000, 
there was um, a historical epoch which really made some international headlines as you may probably have read or heard in the news, international news, news channels where Liberation War veterans um, took it upon themselves to invade uh, farms owned by white commercial farmers. Um, and of course, in the process, they exploited conventional images of power to um, make a certain degree of posturing, which was quite loaded in terms of um, the layers of um, concepts of power and how it was constructed in the process of expropriating land. And as someone who was um, interested and who had already read such episodes in the late Roman Republic, of course, beginning from the time of um, the early Republic, if you want, back to the time of uh, Scipio um, Africanus, attempt to have his Punic War veterans uh, be rewarded with land and the Senate refusing, the Gracchi coming through to try and do the same, but still their reforms were really never appreciated. And many other reformers who came later without actually uh, succeeding, succeeding in doing that. And the, the, the issue became um, um, very, very, very difficult leading to violent episodes and individual generals taking it upon themselves to grant land to their veterans right from the time of Marius through to Sala, down the second term violet, first and second term violet, ending with Octavian, who later became Augustus. Um, so this episode, as I was you know, looking at the events happening in Zimbabwe, I started to get interested to closely look at how concepts of power uh, could be illuminated by comparing the two uh, societies. So this is the flag, flag map of Zimbabwe. You may want to have an appreciation of uh, what the flag looks like. Perhaps the most, um, you know, the frequently asked question that has confronted me concerns why such a comparison between ancient Rome and Africa. And I have tried to answer this question um, by looking at this general tendency of historical alienationism which holds that the ancient Roman world is so different from the present that it has scarcely any value for contemporary Africa and vice versa. And in light of this, I tried to look at two methodological questions that I had to consider before venturing into this comparative enterprise. How does a comparative uh, historical method work in the book that I have just published? Especially if we ask the question that we are confronted by two sets of veterans belonging to different cultures. Is there, is there no difference therefore in their concept of masculinity and of the concept of the war hero itself? Um, so I am mainly guided in the belief in common humanity, which for me offers a background for the comparison of humans and societies belonging to different cultures, places, and times. And this is of course backed by scholarship that refers to the use of far out comparisons in the grounded theory approach, which is an approach to social scientific research proposed by Glazer and Strauss and further articulated by Strauss um, and Corbin. This takes me to move to, uh, to move to the theoretical approaches to the study of classical and African culture and history, which is really at the center of um, what really motivated me to come up with the idea of this book. 
So I try in the book to balance concern with Africa and interest in the effects of an African encounter with classical culture that broadens one's horizons beyond Africa. Specifically, I examine how veteran violence in some ways imitate colonial violence that itself is classical precedence. And I boldly state so in the book that there is indeed a Roman colonial masculinity in Zimbabwe. This emerged as a result of some interviews that I conducted with uh, individual veterans, not every one of them, of course, but some really had gone through a little bit of classical education. And in trying to make sense of the liberation war, they appropriated in a manner of trying to find some scaffold that would enable them to really um, come to, uh, to terms with having to fight in a liberation war, trying to summon whatever literature they had come across. And there's a veteran who had done a little bit of Julius Caesar, um, Sigali course, and was quite inspired at school to even um, draw the, some imaginary vision, some imaginary um, drawing of Julius Caesar as a way um, to sort of get to grips with the environment of war and to inspire himself in the same. Apart from that, um, there is, of course, a connection between the colonialist who was in, in charge of colonial Zimbabwe in terms of how these colonial administrators, administrators had imbibed some concepts of ancient Roman administration um, upon Roman Britain. So there's a recently published article co-authored by myself and John Douglas, my Claymont, where I look at um, how Africans were imagined by colonial, the colonial administrators during the era of um, colonialism, where they appropriated uh, classical precedence as a lens to viewing and understanding local Africans. And as a result, as Jita had argued, they tended to reappropriate Africans, removing them from their geographical location, seeing in them something like voices that were echoing, being echoed between Woma and Jesus Christ's uh, time. So these colonial administrators see masculinity were shaped in a way in terms of how they understood how the Romans administered the ancient Britons themselves. And as the Zimbabwean veteran um, reflected upon himself, especially reflecting upon the violence that he meted against uh, the white commercial farmer and his own fellow black um, a citizen, I discovered that there really is a connection uh, in terms of how violence, how violence reproduces itself uh, in the sense of what Achille Mbembe calls the post colon But to make sense of human um, practice, I found it a bit um, awkward to just go on with a comparison that is not a little bit sophisticated or justified by some, some theory of sorts. So I appropriated the practice theory from the discipline of um, uh, anthropology to make sense of the comparative investigation uh, between the late Roman Republic and contemporary Zimbabwe. So this is not, however, um, possible if one looks at how my comparative investigation makes use of the practice theory. The Zimbabwean war veterans cultural context is accessible life. I can see a Zimbabwean veteran marching in the streets of Harare. I can see a Zimbabwean war veteran doing his thing on the farm. 
I can see him running, I can see him marching, I can see him scream at a white farmer, I could see all those things. But this is, is not possible with the ancient Roman veteran. So Gitz has argued that culture can be studied by observing closely those publicly accessible practices, either through micro observation of largely mute and unnoticed practices, or through thick description of the publicly observable symbolic and ritual practices that structure the possibility of meaning in a given cultural system. Meanings of masculinity generated through descriptions of clearly observable Zimbabwean war veterans ritual practices, actions, ETC are, are contrasted with rituals, practices, and actions of veterans described in the ancient Roman text under investigation in the book. Thus, practice theory helped me to make sense of the cultural and social significance of human activity. The nature of subjectivity, embodiment, meaning and normativity, the character of language and power, and the organization, reproduction and transformation of social and political life. And in my context by military veterans, of course, here, Anthropologist uh, Schatz was theorizing after a particular context, which I so also make use of to make sense of my comparison in trying to understand how Roman veterans and Zimbabwean veterans can also be equally compared. So let me proceed to look at how the comparison is framed. Basically, I look at the narratives and accounts relating to ancient Rome and Zimbabwean war veterans um, that serve to frame several issues within the context of masculinity, expropriation of land and the political economy of the physical bodies of war veterans. How physical bodies of war veterans inform the representation of a veteran masculinity with a view to linking the importance of the relation of cultural expressions of physicality, particularly the body of the veteran and the relation of masculine concepts and land expropriation to observable features of the physical body. Such that when I look at the Roman text, especially um, Tacitus Annals, where he reviews how a soldier's life, land and body were intertwined specifically in the context of um, the rebellion that was instigated by Pecanius in Pannonia. Mention of threadbare garments uh, and naked bodies of a poorly dressed soldier who is equally poorly fed. The argument is based on the body of the soldier whose worth is undervalued considering the toil and labor that he goes through to acquire the land that the rich and eventually appropriated to themselves and ignoring the plight of the veteran. So these are the issues that I discussed looking at narratives um, that are produced by Zimbabwean Liberation War veterans, appealing of course to issues that have a bearing with their bodies, issues that have a bearing to bodily substances that, such as sweat, blood, um, tears, and the associated, associated suffering that is accompanied uh, by the process uh, of war. So I explore the roles played by images of a veteran masculinity in trying to bridge the symbolic gap between, on the one hand, various paraphernalia, such as military boots, military fatigues, weapons, such as sword, shield, guns, axes, body parts, and like I have mentioned, bodily substances. Um, and on the other hand, the struggles for ownership and control of land and influence in which masculine subjectivities and masculine failures of war veterans were determined. So I proceed to look at narratives and anecdotes bearing images of masculinity and other themes distinct or related to masculinity involving war veterans engagement 
in expropriation and in situations where they exhibited irrational impulses or a madness of warfare. This theme of a madness of warfare is the theme that interests me so much and I'll uh, particularly look at it in much detail at the very end of the presentation. Uh, but what brings the two worlds particularly closer um, is the issue of male power um, and the masculinity of the policy. The policy of the Greeks was of course based on separate cities as states. In both Rome and Zimbabwe, I argue that the state extended beyond the walls of a single city. Yet in both cases, although we do not have a walled city, we do have a politically significant area for which the veteran were deemed to provide stability and protection. The politics of power in the two worlds of veteran applied to a space which provided stability and peace through the war efforts of fighters. This space calls to mind a more abstract sense of the word policy that of not the world city, but the body of citizens or the state. The war veterans were concerned about the space relating to their own citizens or a state, such that the politics of power in both worlds claimed Rome and Zimbabwe respectively as prizes of war for the victors. Thus, the veterans in both Rome and Zimbabwe in their attitudes to land acquisition and appropriation of political fields displayed what might be called a masculinity of the police related to police in the sense of the civic community and reminiscent of ancient attitudes towards the police as an actual world city. Uh, we can note that politics in both cases was understood so as to link the state and civic virtue with masculinity. The social system, systems conformed to the masculinity of the policy and the decisive determinations of male power were understood in the military terms of founding and defending one's country. In talking of the masculinity of the policy in connection with Rome, one may also point to references in the ancient texts. For example, Polybius refers to the valiant um, ex of men who fought for the Italian nation and also for the Roman state. That is Polybius, book six, um, paragraph 52, line six to 11. So this idea of a masculinity of, of, of the police and how those who fought in Roman wars of expansion and even civil wars, wars tended to glorify themselves as special individuals, honorable indeed, and who deserve to get um, honored by getting a piece of land for the role that they played in fighting um, for Rome. And this applies equally to Zimbabwe, if you apply my theory of uh, the masculinity of the police. It is important, of course, to look at some differences without assuming, uh, um, making generalizations, so to speak, um, in so far as one might uh, look at it closely. There is, of course, some differences um, in that masculinities are usually situated in a specific geographical location. Differences, of course, in constructions of masculinities in the two societies, in many other societies uh, that one might want to look closely at in trying to convey and make sense whether what obtained in Rome can actually be found elsewhere. Differences and similarities are the order of the day. I have tried to summarize these differences by looking at the idea of how masculinities were spiritually constructed, especially among Zimbabwe guerrilla war veterans. These guerrilla veterans of Zimbabwe have a spiritual aspect of being that relates to masculinity. It is a masculinity that does not generally derive from 
what the physical body of a Zimbabwean veteran is capable of doing per se or alone. But this Zimbabwean veteran's body is deep, deep, deeply imbued with the spiritual significance. It is a body that is a vehicle of ancestors. And the exploits that a Zimbabwean veteran um, it does in war are understood as some extraordinary strength that he receives from his ancestors. But if you look then at the Roman, at a Roman soldier, he is excellent in war and exploits and works of valor through and through without necessarily deriving any abilities from their ancestors. Of course, we may want to remember how when, 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 when they were waging wars, Romans would pray to their god of war, mass, and of course not to their ancestors is one particular difference. To quickly go through another difference, there is a female masculinity in land struggles. You would agree with me that Romans really did not have female soldiers. They, they, their culture uh, simply did not allow for that. But in Zimbabwe, as you may see, this is a ZANU, ZANU PF membership card, and ZANU PF is the ruling uh, political party in Zimbabwe in, uh, in government right now, the governing, uh, the governing political party. As you can see that membership card, on that membership card, there is a woman carrying a baby, holding a hoe and a gun. So the land expropriation exercise was conceived not just in terms of a male, of a male fighter, but also in terms of, a, of, a, of their female counterparts who were regarded also as uh, valiant fighters in the exercise of reclaiming land from, um, from um, the colonialists. But perhaps what is important, um, is the idea of how a female masculinity in land struggles as seen playing out in contemporary Zimbabwe may actually help us to see some hidden aspects of a possible uh, masculinity among the Romans. So drawing on Cornell's structural theory on the state of play of gender, relation, gender relations in a society and on a comparison with the notion of an African female masculinity. In the book, I consider the possibility of arguing for a related masculinity in ancient Rome through exploring the dynamics of the Roman social structure, emphasizing a dialectical relationship between structural constraint and human agents. This is especially pertinent when considering the prohibition of female participation in war in ancient Rome and the agents they displayed in resisting the tramways in matters that in matters of gender, power, and land or property more generally. Ancient Greek and Roman societies had of course an arrangement which would not allow women on the battlefront. There is an incident in Roma's Iliad where the goddess Aphrodite takes part in the battle and is rebuked for doing so by Diomedes. Yet African women in general and Zimbabwe in particular actually uh, participate um, in land expropriations. But it is interesting through the lens of what plays out in contemporary Zimbabwe to see also a female masculinity at play if one looks at Andon's wife, Fulvia, how he gathered himself, herself uh, in military armor and even challenged some um, male generals and went on to challenge Octavian 
over the issue of the right to distribute land also to Andalus veterans. We may also consider rich Roman women and how they were treated and their pleas to the tramways to say, we do not deserve to be expropriated because we have never taken part in your wars. So let us leave us alone to hell with taxation, to hell with any idea of trying us to draw us closer to your um, quarrels and, and wars that are, are going on. So women in ancient Rome, although they are always at the receiving end, it is important to actually acknowledge the fact that there was always this idea that women ended up developing some agents to try and resist patriarchy. Never mind how rigid the Roman society was when it comes to issues of um, women participating in certain things that were deemed to be um, a male, male um, activities. I move on to the task of interpretation. Um, of Roman texts. Where I appropriate images from Zimbabwean media as a way to try and make sense of what was actually happening uh, as recorded in ancient Roman texts. I argue that the Roman texts deprive us of the dramatic effect that I believe was quite you know, present in the processes through which veterans of the late Roman Republic went about um, expropriating land. And the confrontations that they had with owners of plots of land and how they eventually um, took over possession of such properties. So my argument tries to understand the Roman veterans combat motion. So I frame the veterans combat motion, appropriation of space and the exertion of force in land expropriation through four categories, a four categories schema to analyze veteran masculinities in the two societies. The involvement of the body is quite central in the analysis in so far as it relates to acts of expropriation by war veterans and may theoretically take various forms. So the four categories that I have mentioned provide a framework upon which I draw in the interpretation of the Roman text. This framework allows me to locate the Roman veteran and Zimbabwean veteran in an environment where their actions and the agents of their bodies can be analyzed. It also allows me to perceive indications in the Roman text of expropriation and proscriptions as productive of not only military violence, but also images of masculinities. I quickly go through the categories as follows. The first one looks at appeal to weapons and physical achievement or the results of physical achievement, e.g. wounds or scars in battle to justify demands for land or office. This category allows visualization of the Roman veteran's body in deployment of masculinity and this communicative environment. The second category looks at physical innovation of land and the exertion of force on owners of land to punish and drive them out or injure them. This category enables visualization of the environment of expropriation and also allows visualization of the Roman veteran and his victim in motion. The third category looks at combat with occupiers of land or anyone resisting. This category allows visualization of the Roman veteran in combat motion. And the last one looks at the use of verbal communication and physical performance to intimidate or threaten 
the use of force to assert ownership of land. This category allows visualization of the Roman veteran in the practice and the performance of violence and masculinity. I've given here an example of um, a line. You can have a complete picture by looking at Eclux 9, lines 2 to 4, where a veteran um, just comes through and says, um, these things are mine. Leave, you old, old farmers. So this idea of a veteran performing violence through ordering, ordering a, the owner of a plot, the owner of a farm to vacate their farm is quite loaded with um, concepts um, of masculinity, which I explore in detail in the book. There's also this idea of veterans and massing in the city. Um, and also the exercise or practice of brandishing of arms. It helps us to understand how masculinity was wielded by weapons in the practice of brandishing arms in the practices of assembly. Veterans and massing or marching in the city, if you refer, for instance, to a passage in Dio, uh, book 48, um, the passage can be analyzed functionally to express the possible meanings of war veterans' actions. In this case, the veterans were called senators wearing soldiers' boots on account of the military boots they were wearing, which gave a sense of, of subversion of established boundaries and of challenging condors of place by assuming a civic role or duty meant for senators. Dio's description gives a sense of what the veterans looked like in their military boots and portrays the veterans act as a subversive gesture. What Dio describes are the politics of appearance and gesture practiced by the assembled veterans. To some extent, but not in every respect, the passage also conveys a sense of a masculinity expressed through the exhibitionistic and audacious display of hordes of veterans gathering in, a, in the city of Rome on their way to the capital. Further analysis of the passage can review some masculine motifs. The gathering of the veterans produced a spectacle which proceeded in the form of an interrupted conversation which the veterans maintained among themselves for their intended purposes. In the moment of their mediation and the management of the conflict between Andon and Octavia, their gathering in Rome and eventually at the capital was a portrayal of their power, not just in terms of the spectacle of their mass gathering, but also as a loaded social and political gesture constituting an embodied practice in the political economy of power in this representation. The spectacle can be understood as an embodied social and political practice which derived from their gathering as a custom and a ritual that evoked meaning and power. So I analyze in greater detail a, a number of passages that ex I extract from uh, the ancient Roman texts, and it is not possible for me to exhaust those passages. Uh, what I can do, the least I can do is to refer people to my book so that they can uh, really uh, go through and um, make sense of the analysis that I make of these passages. Lastly, I now look at a madness of warfare. As you can see um, in this slide, this is um, a war veteran who is praying to the camera. And I'm saying this is not just for the camera, but I 
did my field research where a long chid now research where I managed to uh, observe how these veterans were going about their business in order to earn respect by way of intimidating the white, the white commercial farmers and even uh, their fellow blacks. Um, the purpose of my examination of visual images of the guerrilla veterans made and violent disposition is to build my imaginative reconstruction, for instance, of Julius Caesar's Fasalus fighters as depicted by Lucan. So I have a deliberate approach of appropriating a specific ritual practice by Zimbabwean war veterans that I apply to a specific context uh, in a particular Roman context. And in this case, I'm interested in looking um, see Fasalus. I argue that built within certain social manifestations of masculinity is a certain strand of madness, a transgression of boundaries or an extreme expression of behavior that can be linked with murder, sexuality, wandering expropriation, themes that dominate Lucan's D. Bellocchivili as well. I thus examine the role of masculinity and the madness of war in the context of expropriation. Images of violent madness from another society are not necessarily counterintuitive in our efforts to put into perspective what ancient terminologies such as ferocia and intendio meant in their Roman setting and context. These images are in my case used as aids to reimagine Caesar's ferocious men. The images enhance my reimagination of what a made veteran looked like in the actions he is likely to have performed. So as I was doing field work, I bumped into an eyewitness who experienced a very, very traumatic incident where a liberation war veteran confronted someone whom they thought was not in support of what they were doing on the farms. And they accused him of supporting a neo-colonial agenda. And this particular veteran had been injured during the war of liberation in a gun battle. And the community knew that he had a bullet lodged in his body. And the doctors had actually told him that the bullet could not be extracted from his body because it sat precariously close to one of his ribs. So he had lived in misery ever since. And upon fighting, finding um, members of his team of expropriation assaulting the said victim, the veteran got very excited and he cried out in the Shona language, Sudurukai imbomirai kumurova ne shamu, ndoda kita okuruma ne mas, you know, ang, kuti angu kukurwaza pandino ita in shangu pachangu. And in English, it means, moreover, you guys, stop hitting this fellow with his jambox. I want to bite him with my teeth. I actually want him to feel how painful I am. Upon which the veteran knelt down and unstrapped the trouser of this fellow and brought it down and proceeded to bite the victim's buttocks, spitting out chunks of buttock flesh and biting again. This time, um, not swallowing the chunks of buttock flesh because he was eventually restrained. This is an act of madness where certain boundaries of normal behavior were crossed uh, by these veterans. And when one looks at looking Sifasalia, we see a reference, for instance, to Words like infanda, words like saeva, 
referring to madness of war. Words like barely furious, mentioned in Luke and book five, line 246. And I argue that there could be a connection between madness also and sexuality, because I'm looking at themes of rape, sex and murder as represented in Luke and um, Sifasalia. We know from the story of Sophocles in Cicero that Sophocles viewed the sexual desire of his youth as a wild and furious master. Domino agresti ac furioso. Uh, Cicero's disenactured 1447. So wildness and fury had for Sophocles and Cicero in association with sexuality and thus the term Saevus and mistakenly connecting wildness and fury may possibly connect sexuality. Then comes the reference to Priamia Matis, the words of Mars. Mars is the god of war, but as we know from Homer's Odyssey, his words include the sex with Aphrodite. So although the primary meaning here is that of the words of war, a possible sexual connotation is not absent. Finally, there is the word Amari, to be loved. Definitely a word associated with the sex even in our modern culture. So the images or ideas of the passage present us with the following associations in order. There is despoiling, despoiling in Lucan with possible sexual meaning, desecration, non-denial with possible sexual meaning, a girl, mothers, young women, unspeakable sexual things, wildness and fury with possible sexual meaning, rewards a masculine war god with a mythological history involving adultery, and finally love with a possible sexual overtone. Some of the potential sexual expressions taken in isolation might not have a clear sexual meaning, but the fact that these expressions are part of a sequence of ideas and images involving infanda and unspeakable things raises the question of whether it is simply a coincidence that certain images can be sexually interpreted or whether the sexual associations are related to the meaning of the infanda expression and the theme of sexuality runs through the passage. Yet regardless of how far we can see sexual meaning in the passage, we may still see in the reference to infanda a sign of warlike spirit expressed in a masculine and sexual fashion and argue that the martial attitude of war veterans portrayed in Lucan is linked to masculine sexuality and masculine madness. Um, sorry. Yet regardless of, how, regardless of how far we can see sexual meaning in the passage, we may see in the reference to Infanda a sign of warlike spirit expressed in a masculine and sexual fashion and argue that the martial attitude of war veterans is portrayed in looking as linked to masculine sexuality and masculine madness. Um, so these are some of the things that I explore looking at Lucan Svathalia, especially book five. And I look at how these um, practices inform attitudes to gender when it comes to how a war veteran goes about ideals of power and their construction as he tries to get what he right, rightfully thinks uh, he, he, he deserves. Um, this is the end of my presentation, uh, that which I've actually uh, sort of rushed through to summarize in order to allow time for questions. Uh, but allow me to say, these are the issues that I um, consider in the book uh, to interpret Roman texts using real life experiences on the ground by liberation war veterans of Zimbabwe's independence war. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Mlambo. That was really fascinating. And um, I'm sure we do 
have some questions. So if anyone has a question, you can feel free to just unmute yourself and ask it. Um, uh, Allegra, everyone has the ability to do that, right? Um, or if you prefer, you can- I believe so, um, yes. You can type your question in the chat um, <clears throat> and I will, uh, um, I will read it. I, I have a question to start, which is that, um, Dr. Mlambo, you said that um, you suspected that some of the veterans that you interviewed were drawing on some classical education that they had had. So wh where did that happen? What, what, what does the sort of teaching of the classics look like for the average Zimbabwe, and I, I was I was surprised um, that uh, they had that these war veterans had had a, a, an education in the classics. And wh how did that happen? Thank you very much for that question. This anecdote um, particularly surprised me. This guy is very educated. Um, he was really not a foot soldier. In the liberation war, uh, uh, in the liberation war itself, but he is, he was one of the top um, commanders who joined the the, the 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 war front rather late during the struggle, and had actually uh, gone to school. And as he reported to me, uh, part of the syllabus that he 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 studied at school. Um, enabled them to do a bit of Latin and some texts uh, of quite a number of uh, Latin authors. And of course, Roman history that um, involved Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars um, and the general history of the, of the Roman Republic going back even to, founding, to the founding of ancient Rome. So this syllabus, um, it really didn't surprise me because my mother as well um, underwent a bit of a similar education at mission schools where Latin was actually one of the subjects that they, 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 they took. So according to his experience, um, he really was fascinated by Roman ideals of of valor. And when he joined the war, it is, he reports that it was quite natural for him to try and relate with what he had studied in order to make sense of the war. I found it quite a bit, um, you know, strange until I bumped into an article um, that reflects on what that guy uh, in the guy in Norway, who I forget his name, who immersed himself in some military um, reflections before he undertook his terrorist, um, you know, um, action against people who were having some a, a holiday in, at some island in Norway. If you connect that, that kind of idea uh, with the logic of this um, uh, vet, war veteran, um, I, I, I began to understand that it could have been possible that when one is marooned and trying to find a way of escape or at least to um, calm his nerves in the, in the thick of things, surely the human mind can really fantasize to try and rest on something that can enable them to make sense of their most difficult situation. So this is the idea, a quite a strange anecdote that I came across uh, while we were having drinks at the senior common room. He's a quite frequent um, colleague at the senior common room bar for drinks. I'm sure if one of you guys happens to come to Zimbabwe, I might actually take you to him so that he may repeat his story. Over to you. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Uh, the first up is uh, Mark uh, Mark Reuter. Uh, yes, uh, 
Professor, thank you very much for your talk. It's, uh, it was a, certainly a challenging talk, but uh, you're, I, I look forward to reading your book. Um, I just wondered if you could just uh, point me in some directions. I was very um, touched by your focus on the common humanity. And we are, I find so many today ex putting the focus on the diversity. Um, what what uh, prompted you to land on that? It seems really interesting to me. Thank you very much for your question. Um, these are some of the ideas that I and my colleague, John Douglas, my Claremont, are developing in a book that we are co-writing. So we are looking at ideas of objective uh, humanism, uh, historical, alienationism and ideas of uh, pro progressivism, which if you want to look at uh, it, it is not easy for people who are entrenched in a certain ideological stance to say, the past is past and gone by. The ancient Romans um, had their own metaphysical, epistemological and ontological realities, which never really converge with an African experience. So from a very practical point of view, as a practicing classicist, trying of course to make relevance of um, the teaching of this um, discipline of ours, we try to stretch our imagination in order to um, change the locus of cultural reference, uh, not just to look at classical Greece and Rome, but also to look at points of conduct in the cultures of the two societies and how ideas of a common humanity may be explored through relevant theories that may enable uh, the comparison of these two different uh, societies, and in my case, the appropriation of the practice theory. So um, there's a book that is forthcoming, and we I have just borrowed some of the ideas from the book as a way to uh, just give you a foretaste of the kind of approach of uh, you know the study, teaching, and research of classics that we are um, you know pursuing as African classicists. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, th thank you very much. I, I hope Paideia will follow up with you and, and invite you to give a talk on your upcoming book. <laughs> okay, thank you, looking forward to that. Okay, the next question is from uh, M. Dores Cruz. I'm sorry, I cannot turn on my video. It's not working for some reason. So you just have to bear with me uh, with my picture at least. Um, uh, actually, it's not really a, a question. It's more um, a comment on uh, uh, the uh, what uh, what Robert was mentioning before in terms of the, the education. And uh, I'm an, uh, an, an Africanist, I'm actually an archeologist and I started the Africanist archeologist, but I started my life as a classical archeologist as an undergrad. And, um, and Obert and I, we, we have been colleagues at the University of, uh, uh, of Cologne. So that's why I, I know his, his work. But what I wanted to expand a little bit, it was in relation to the first question on the, the classic uh, um, education, uh, basically, and that may be something that most people are not aware, it's the, the fact that the, the colonial powers basically use the, the, the types of education and the curricula of education from their own countries in the, in the colonies. And so one of the jokes uh, uh, among uh, archaeologists it is in relation to the, the, fr the French system for Senegal, for example, where some of the, the, the books in, a, in on some of the lectures in, a, in, a, in Senegal were about uh, the goals, our ancestors. And so it's actually became a um, kind of a joke among, uh, among uh, people who do uh, work in, in, um, in African archeology, span at least in African anthropology. And it's 
and I'm originally from Portugal, so I, my knowledge, it's more about the, the Portuguese colonial uh, world, uh, where even today, for example, in Mozambique, uh, uh, which has been a place where I've been working for a while, the, the high school students, they read uh, what the students in Portugal read. So they read, uh, uh, for example, medieval, Portuguese medieval poetry, uh, and they don't read the books by African scholars. And so th there is this kind of replication of the education system from the colonies, or I'm sorry, from the, the colonial powers from the metropole that ends up uh, leading to some people being better at uh, knowing the, um, I don't know, literature or history of the colonial powers than of their own countries, even uh, 40 years after independence or 50 years after independence. So this was just a comment that I wanted to add. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, we're almost out of time. In fact, we're a few minutes over. So um, if there are no other questions, um, please join me in thanking Professor Mambo again uh, for a fascinating lecture. We really appreciate your time and uh, I hope everyone buys his book uh, and checks it out. And uh, yes, we would love to have you come back uh, another time in the future and tell us more about the exciting developments of um, classics curricula in Zimbabwe and elsewhere in Southern Africa. So I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was a, my pleasure to share with you um, the, my research and uh, the, the, the book itself, what, what it contains. Um, hopefully you will be able to um, you know, make sense of it, but I promise you, if you grab a copy of the book, it will be quite easy for you to really follow the argument. You know, it is, it is not been easy for me to really uh, put together the very uh, entangled um, nuances uh, in this comparison uh, of ancient Rome and contemporary Zimbabwe, also involving uh, theories from anthropology and various other presuppositions as a framework of doing classics from, from, from an African uh, perspective. So I, I tried, I've tried my best and I hope you managed to learn something. Thank you very much for listening. No, you did a great job. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll see you at the next installment. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.